Hello, this is a re-record of this morning's lecture. Something happened with my explain everything and the lecture was lost. So this is a redo. So we were starting with this bullet point down here, the density first molar mass of the gas. This is where we left off in class on Friday. We might recall, of course, that PV is equal to NRT. And if you're writing moles as mass of a molar mass, so just number of grams divided by number of grams per mole, that that would equal the number of moles. So n is just mass over molar mass. And so if we, we were to rewrite m over molar mass times rt is equal to pv, then we can write and recognize dividing both sides by volume, and writing m over v, rt is equal to p times molar mass, so multiplying both sides by molar mass, dividing both sides by volume, and then let's divide both sides by RT, and with that density, which is mass over volume, is equal to P molar mass divided by RT. So the density of a gas sample is only related to the pressure of the gas, molar mass of the gas divided by RT. So we got a couple examples here. So what is the pressure of seven and a half grams of CH4 in a two and a half liter vessel at 23 degrees C. Well, we can say PV is equal to NRT. Let's divide by volume. So PV is equal to NRT divided by volume. So we'll have 7.50 grams times 16.0 grams per mole. That's CH4. So that's our moles times 0 0.08206 liter atmospheres per mole Kelvin, and then times 296 Kelvin. We got to go to Kelvin. That's 296 Kelvin. Let me divide by 2.50 liters, and this gives us a pressure of 4.56 atm. Let me do this arithmetic. And so then when we recognize 1 atm, 760 tor, that this would equal 3460. Let's actually come back real quick. 7.5 divided by 16 times 0 0.08206 times 296. Times 296 divided by 2.5 is 4.55. And so that's 4.55 times 760 to go over to Tor, because we wanted this both in ATM and Tor, leads this to be 3460. So we can do our conversions. And I wanted to merely point out, if you want to pressure in some other unit than ATM, I wouldn't necessarily change your R constant and redo the math there. I would just calculate an ATM and then convert ATM to Tor afterwards. What is the density of the gas sample? Well, density, m over v, p molar mass, divided by rt. So this would be pressure 4.55 atm times 16.0 grams per mole, divided by the gas constant, times 296 kelvin. Kelvin cancels. Mole cancels, ATM cancels, everything but grams per liter. So this works out to be 4.55 times 16 divided by 0 .82, 0 0.08206 divided by 296. So that's 3.00 grams per liter. And then we could have also recognized that density is just mass over volume. 
So it's just 7.50 grams divided by 2.50 liters. That's also equal to 3.00 grams. So two ways in this particular problem that we can work through density just from m over v or p molar mass over rt, and of course they're equal to each other. So we can generate gases from chemical reactions. So sort of the, the issue is here, how do you apply the gas law to some chemistry examples? And so we can generate gases from a chemical reaction. So here we're asking how much mass of sodium azide has to be decomposed in order to fill an airbag with 50 liters of 1.25 atm of N2 at 22 degrees C by this reaction. So only N2 here is a gas. So N2 is going to fill our airbag. So the pressure of N2, or excuse me, the we're trying to solve for the moles. moles is equal to PV over RT. So the moles of N2 related to the pressure of N2, 1.25 atm times the volume, 50 liters, divided by the gas constant. And then times 22 Point zero plus 273.15. And so this is going to equal 1.25 times 50 divided by 0 0.08206 and then divide by 295.15. So 2.58 moles of N2. So that's how many moles of N2, but for every three moles of N2, we need two moles of sodium azide. So the last step is trying to solve for the number of grams of sodium N3. The 2.58 moles of N2 are required to fill this airbag. For every three moles of N2 that are produced, we have to decompose two moles of NaN3 and one mole of NaN3 is comprised of 23 plus 1401, so that's about 65.03 grams of NaN3. So 2.58 times 2 divided by 3 times 65. is 112 grams. So you take a 112 gram sample of the azide, it can be decomposed into something containing N2 gas, and then that fills our airbag. Now airbags used to use this reaction, they've kind of moved away from it because the sodium often goes along with the N2 and the sodium can actually burn the airbag and then the person in the car. Okay, so let's get into another sort of property of substances that deals with having more than one component of a gas present, so a gas mixture. So if the two gases that don't react are combined into a container, they act as if they're alone in the container because they're non-interacting gas particles. The total pressure of the mixture would equal the sum of the partial pressures if each gas were present all by itself. And so if you were thinking of air, the total pressure of air is going to be due to the individual components, nitrogen plus oxygen plus argon plus all the other stuff. Now, these percentages here, again, are about 0.78, 0 0.21, and plus about 0 0.01. Now, these are the fractions. So, like, error is 78% N2, 21% O2, 1% argon by volume. And so then their pressure percentages actually end up being the same as well. So the total pressure of air is about standard atmospheric pressure, 1 atm. So if our standard pressure of air is a standard atmospheric pressure, then we're going to have about 0.78 atm, about 0.21 atm, and about 0.01 atm. You can see that they add up to one atmosphere. 
So we know the partial pressure of each of the components and they simply add up to the total pressure of the sample. So, you know, if our air sample is an atmosphere, then we just add up all of our individual components to get the total pressure. And then let's take a little bit about mole fractions versus pressure fractions. So because each gas in the mixture acts as if it were alone, not interacting, then we can relate you know, the partial pressure of a component one to the total pressure by taking the fact that you know P is equal to N R T over V. So the moles of component one is just the moles of one times R T divided by V. And the moles of the total is just the N T R T divided by V. And so we can express the partial pressure of component one as the moles of component one times R T divided by V. And then that equals NT, you know, divide by the total pressure. So NT, RT, divide by V. So because the two gases are in the same container at the same temperature of the same volume, RT and V cancel. Simplifying the ratio of the two pressures, the N1, the total pressure, down to being equal to the mole ratio or the mole fraction, N1 over NT. So this would be like the moles of O2 compared to the total number of moles in the gas sample, that this is how we define the mole fraction of O2. So the mole fraction is the moles of the component one compared to the total, so N1 over NT. And so if this is equal to XO2 or X1, so X1 is N1 over NT, and then we can multiply by the total pressure, so the partial pressure of a component is the mole fraction of the component times the total pressure. All right, so uh, in lecture today, I solved this problem two ways. Today, I'm gonna, in this video, I'm gonna show three ways to solve for our total pressure. So our total pressure would be the sum of our two individual partial pressures. And so I can work out that the partial pressure of helium is just the moles of helium times RT divided by V. And then I can add the moles of O2 times RT divided by V. And if I do this, I recognize that this is 4.003 grams per mole. O2 is 32.00 grams per mole. That are moles of helium. It's 1 point, or it's 5 divided by 4.003. So it's 1.25 moles of helium times RT divided by V, so, you know, R is the usual R, T is 298 Kelvin, V is 15 liters. And then work that out, so that's 1.25 times 0.08206 plus 298 times 298K, and then divide by 15 liters, it's 2.04, atmospheres, and then plus 5 divided by 32 for oxygen times 0 0.08206 times 298 divided by 15 gives me a pressure of 0 0.255, so it's called 2.55 atm. And so that equals, when we add these together, 2.29 ATM. So just take 2.036, and then um, let me write this out more precisely. So we'll have 5 divided by 32. I just want to write this in here. That's 0 0.156 moles times RT divided by V. And then that equals 0 0.255 ATM. So 0 0.255 plus 2.036 is 2.29 ATM. So answer D. So that's method one. It's just adding up our two individual partial pressures, solving for those, and adding them up. Now, an alternate approach would have been that our total pressure would just be related to the NT times RT divided by V. And this is almost just from doing algebra up here, since RT and V are the same for both 
gases, we could have just solved this by taking NT, so taking 1.25 plus 0.156 equal to 1.406, so about 1.41 moles times RT divided by V, and that's going to equal 1.41 times 0 0.08206 times 298 divided by the volume of the container, 15. That's also 2.29. And the only, like it's technically 2.30, but it's just from the slight rounding of this as being like really 1.406 or something like that. So um, if I do 5 divided by 32 plus 5 divided by 4.003, that's 1.405. So that times 0 0.08206 times 298 divided by 15. Just being meticulous to show that this is equal to um, 0.405 times 0 0.08206 times 298 divided by 15. But that equals 2.29. Now the question becomes, can we solve this a third way? It's always nice to have options. So a third way might be just relating our mole fraction of a component times the total pressure is equal to the partial pressure of that component from the previous slide. And so if we take, for example, let's use, it doesn't matter which one we use, let's use oxygen. So the partial pressure of oxygen we saw was equal to 0 0.255 atm. That's going to equal the mole fraction of O2. So the mole fraction of O2, partial pressure of O2. So the mole fraction of O2 is going to equal the moles of O2. So 5 divided by 32.00. And that divided by the total number of moles, 1.405 moles. So more precisely, this is 1.405. So the mole fraction of O2 is equal to 0 0.1112. That's unitless, it's just a ratio. And so we can sub that in, 0 0.1112 times the total pressure. We can then solve the total pressure. So I know the mole fraction of oxygen is 0 0.255. I can divide that by 0.1112, and I get 2.29. So the total pressure should be 0.255 ATM divided by 0 0.1112. And that also equals 2.29. So three ways, one is just relating the sum of the two individual partial pressures. The second method is the total moles, just PV is equal to NRT, plugging in the total moles. And the third way is relating, well, you know, we can relate the partial pressure of a component to its mole fraction and the total pressure. And all three are interrelated to each other, so it's just options for solving this problem. Okay, so let's look at this problem here. So another chemistry application of the ideal gas law is finding molar masses with the technique known as the Dumas bulb technique. So in this technique here, we fill a bulb with um, a liquid. So we want to first take an empty, clean bulb we want to dry it out so it's nice and clean, get its mass, and then we want to fill it with liquid, you know, with about 5 to 10 mils of a liquid. This vessel is 355.3 milliliters, so we put about 5 to 10 mils of a liquid in here. And then we don't come close to filling it with a liquid, just a little bit. Now what you want to do is then put that liquid into a boiling bath, or put the bulb with the liquid into a boiling water bath, then you want to submerge the entire tube, and then what's going to happen, as long as the liquid has a boiling point 
that's less than 373 Kelvin. And obviously it's greater than 298 Kelvin because it's a liquid at room temperature. As long as it, all I'm saying, as long as this liquid boils at a temperature lower than the boiling point of water, then that sample is going to vaporize. So the liquid vaporizes, it's going to push the air out of this container. So the air is pushed out of the container. Then the only gas particles in the container is due to being that sort of liquefied substance. So I'm going to call it the pressure of the liquid. It's not really liquid. It's liquid that's gasified. So the gasified liquid or the vaporized liquid occupies the container and all the air has been pushed out due to the vaporization of this liquid. So you can imagine having, you know, um, a, a lot of the liquid to vaporize will help push the air out of the container so that the inside gas is just comprised of the um, molecules of the vaporized liquid that was in that liquid sample. And so then in this technique, you take a liquid, liquid vaporize it in the boiling water bath to determine the molar mass of the gas. And then from this data, we should be able to calculate the molar mass. So the key number here is once all the liquid has vaporized, so once this liquid is gone and we don't see it anymore, we then take the tube, um, take the, the bulb out of water, let it cool down, and then that gas then goes back to being a liquid. So we go liquid to gas, push all the air out of the container, and then we go gas back to liquid when the substance cools back to room temperature. And so then once it's cooled back to room temperature, we take a final mass, so 1.1246 minus the empty mass, so that difference is 1.12 grams. That's the mass of our liquid sample that had been vaporized. So that's the, the mass of our gas. If we could divide by the molar mass of the gas, it would tell us the moles of the gas. Okay, and so then if we did this in the lab, we would be writing down the atmospheric pressure from a barometer in units millimeters of mercury. So we're probably going to want to convert this over to ATM. 760 millimeters per ATM, exactly. So that's 1.015 ATM. Now, the way we might go about solving this problem here is that, you know, if we recall that our density was M over V and that was P molar mass divided by RT, well, we want to solve for molar mass. So our molar mass will be equal to MRT divided by PV. So the molar mass of a gas is equal to the mass of the gas in the sample times R times the temperature of the gas divided by the pressure of the gas times the volume. Now the pressure of the gas is just maintained at atmospheric pressure because the container is open to the atmosphere. So it's pressure can't exceed atmospheric pressure inside of this container. So the mass of our gas, 1.12 grams, was the amount of liquid that reliquified after the gas had condensed back into its vapors. We multiply this by the gas constant. Multiply by the temperature. Now, the temperature we use is 373 Kelvin because that's the temperature at which this sample was a gas. And so we're a gas at 100 degrees C, 373 Kelvin. And then we divide by the pressure, 1.015 ATM and 0 0.3553 liters. And so then our liters cancels, our ATM cancels, our Kelvin cancels, only units not canceling, grams per mole. So we work out 1.12 times 0 0.08206 times 373, divide by 1.015, divide by 0.3553. I uh, 
type something wrong. Let me do this real quick. Um, this works out to 95.1. grams per mole. Okay, and so this is one of not many ways that we have of finding the molar mass of a sample. You know, this isn't super applicable to all substances because we need to have something be a liquid um, at room temperature. We need it to then vaporize to the gas phase before 373 Kelvin. Otherwise, we need to use some other sort of boiling bath. Maybe we need to use an oil bath if it has a higher uh, boiling point, that gets a little bit trickier to do in the laboratory. We actually sometimes do this experiment in 1210. I don't think we're doing it this semester, though. But it's an experiment that you can actually do in the laboratory to try to figure out the molar mass of a gas sample. So again, it's just being related back to this expression here. Molar mass, MRT, divided by PV. Okay, and so then the um, next topic for today is the kinetic molecular theory of gases, just for a way to describe the motion of gases um, to get a little bit of a better understanding of how gases behave. So gas particles, of course, have to be in random motion because there's a tremendous number of particles that are non-interacting. So these particles have a negligible volume, negligible attractive forces. Um, and so these are ideal gas law assumptions as well, the negligible volume, attractive forces, random motion. And then a few other details we get from the kinetic molecular theory of gases is that the gas samples have to have, to have a constant average kinetic energy. What does this mean? Well, kinetic energy is one half mv squared. And so a given gas sample has so much energy within the sample. And then that energy goes into the particles having some average set of velocities. Well, the average kinetic energy in the sample can't just spontaneously increase on its own. So in other words, if one gas particle wants to travel faster, maybe it's going to be collided uh, with a molecule that's traveling slower. So you have a fast particle, maybe it hits a slower particle, and then that causes the slow particle to move faster. So you have a fast particle hit a slow particle, and so the slow particle speeds up, and then the fast particle collides off it and moves slower. And so we have collisions take place, but the collisions have to conserve energy. And so our kinetic energy on average means that the average velocities are constant for a gas sample. The only way to change the kinetic energy distribution would be to change temperature. Average kinetic energy is proportional to temperature. So kinetic energy, proportional to T. So you increase the temperature, you increase the kinetic energy, increase the kinetic energy, you're gonna increase the velocity of the particles on average, their masses are constant. And so if you increase the kinetic energy, you can slightly increase the velocity of a particle. So this question here, this is like an old test question. So when a gas is compressed at a constant temperature, so we have a piston that reduces the volume of some container, what happens? Well, we know the pressure goes up, but the question is why? Does the pressure go up because there's more collisions with particles with the walls of the container? I think that's a pretty good explanation. And so if you imagine you have a container that has, you know, some particles in it, and these particles are hitting the container every so often, they're hitting the walls of the container. If you drop the volume in half, then we're going to be striking the part the walls more often. We're going to have more collisions with the wall. So the frequency of collisions of particles with the container walls is going to increase. And this is sort of the very definition of pressure, that pressure is equal to mass times acceleration divided by the area. It's a force exerted for, per unit area. Um, this A should be little a. So for acceleration. So mass times acceleration divided by area. So the pressure exerted onto a square area is the definition of pressure. So we have more collisions. We have more mass being exerted onto that square area. We have an increase in our pressure. So statement one describes why it is that our pressure is increasing when we cut the volume in half. 
In statement two, the average velocity of the particles increases can only be true if the temperature increases. So in order to increase the average velocity of the particles, we have to increase the temperature. And we don't increase the temperature because we're at a constant temperature. I had a good question after class today, which was, can't you increase the pressure or the energy inside the, the cell by the work required to reduce the volume? And the answer is, well, even if you could increase the heat and the temperature inside the vessel this way, somehow the constant temperature would have to kick in. Maybe this is taking place inside of a water bath where there's no heat change that's possible. There's no, you know, that the temperature inside the um, volume here is constant. And so in order to increase the average velocity of the particles, we have to increase the temperature. And we can't do that within a constant temperature problem. And even then, I think the work required is that some external force has to undergo an energy change in order to lower the volume and that the heat change can still be a constant. So even though W, we have to apply work, so work has to be done on the system, so that means work is greater than zero, but then that the Q can still be equal to zero. The heat change is still equal to zero for that process. So only statement one is true here. Statement two is not true. Statement two requires a temperature change. So then we can look at some graphs of temperature versus the molecular speed. And so we're looking at the fraction of molecules with a particular speed. And so at zero degrees C, we have our greatest fraction of our molecules close to, I don't know, around 500. So this is 500. So close to 400 uh, meters per second. Um, and then if we increase to 100 degrees C with the same gas, we see that now our most probable peak is around 500. So we've shifted the average velocity of the particles upward, but notice that there's still a variety of particles, still a good fraction of particles that travel pretty slow, and there's still a good fraction of particles that travel very fast. So the range of speed is still very big. And notice that what's happening with the red is that we're really stretching out these velocities, and they're just going to go to a slightly higher uh, velocity before they kind of approach zero. And so we might get, you know, particles for the 100 degree sample that go up to maybe about, you know, 12 or 1300 degrees or 12 or 1300 meters per second. So we might be getting up to 1250 to 1500 meters per second at 100 degrees C, but at zero, we're pretty much bottoming out pretty close to 1000 meters per second. So we're really stretching out those frequencies or stretching out those energies, having more particles on average travel faster the warmer we warm up our sample. So warm up the sample, on average, our velocity of our particles are increasing. Now there's three different types of um, velocities that we can compare. One is the most probable, that's the highest peak of our velocities. And so the, the, um, the speed exhibited by the largest fraction of molecules is our most probable. So that's the top of the peak. Our average is the average speed of all the molecules. We just take a simple computed average is the average. And then the root mean squared is the speed for which the kinetic energy is equal to the average kinetic energy. So kinetic energy, one half mv squared. And so that's where this one's coming from here. And so these have some connection to some fundamental um, constants. So the most probable velocity is two RT divided by um, molar mass. Um, the, the VRMS is equal to the square root of 3 RT divided by molar mass. And then the average is in the middle. Um, I didn't know this in class. If somebody showed me this after. It's 8 over pi times RT divided by molar mass. And so 8 divided by pi Weird. So 8 divided by 3.14 is 2.55. You know, so kind of in between our 2 and our 3. So the key, though, is that as you increase the temperature, you increase these values. If you increase the temperature, you increase these average velocities or root mean square velocities or the most probable velocities. So increasing temperature increases these values on, on average. And if you decrease temperature, you make them slower. And then um, we 
we'll talk about this more next time, but the molar mass of the particles as well comes into play. If you go to a smaller particle, you go to a faster velocity on average. So smaller particles will move faster. So that's how we can kind of compare our most probable or average or in square velocities. And so we're, where we'll go with this next time is kind of relating different gases in terms of their speeds. But you can imagine the lighter the particle, the faster the velocity, the heavier the particle, the slower the velocity, because they each have the same kinetic energy to play with. So they have equal kinetic energies, then, then we're going to have to have for a light particle a high velocity or for a heavy particle a low velocity on average. But we'll get into this uh, slide here a little bit more on Monday after break. Uh, I did a demonstration in class where we started with the solution. I guess this probably wouldn't have made sense in the lecture video anyways, but I took um, two uh, beakers and I added uh, some chemicals to each one of them that made one um, the unfortunate color of blue and the other the unfortunate color of uh, what most people call yellow. And so then um, what we, we, we saw was that you could use a chemical reaction to turn those colors into scarlet and gray. So hopefully scarlet and gray, just like our chemistry example, triumphs on Saturday. So enjoy the holiday weekend and enjoy the football game, especially if you're going to it. Um, travel safe, and we will see you back here afterwards next week. Take care, everybody.